Welcome to this introductory plenary session. Ah, here's Mercedes. Uh, of Reconnecting Citizens. Sorry? Okay. We start. You, you want to say hello to? Okay. So I start again. Good morning. Now, the, the, I want to tell you about this room, first of all. This room is a mobile phone and an iPod, iPad free zone. So I don't want to look around and find everybody looking at their, uh, their screens. I want you to try to resist the urge to be connected to the outside world for at least a few minutes. And by showing attention to encourage the panelists here to say something intelligent as opposed to something which they thought they would say anyway rather than uh, speak to what you want to hear. That's the first thing. The second thing is I want to try to operate this session so that you participate. So every time I look into the room and want somebody to speak, I don't want one of these long, embarrassing silences when you wonder whether everybody's awake or not. So while it's going on, think about things that you would like to say. But think about short things that you would like to say, not long things that you would like to say. I don't really want from anyone blockbuster speeches. We lose 10 or 15 minutes because of the electronic machines downstairs. The interpreters all have to go for lunch on time. And so we, uh, we need to use our time as uh, sensibly as, and, and as well as we can. I won't uh, introduce the... Uh, the panel. Uh, well, I will. I will uh, give them the chance to uh, say a little bit about themselves for about 30 seconds and at least to say whether they are happy to be here or whether they wish they were somewhere else. Um, my name is Meadows. I used to work in the European Commission. I'm a special advisor to the Commissioner for Social Policy, Laszlo Andor. And at the moment, I'm working a great deal in China, from where I returned yesterday and to where I will go again on Monday. I bet next Monday, I bet no one in the room has come as far as me for this meeting. Mercedes uh, uh, Bresso is from the Committee of the Regions. Mercedes, uh, introduce yourself very briefly. <laughs> uh, but, um... Sono, uh, userò l'italiano perché c'è la cabina italiana, eh, sono vicepresidente del Comitato delle Regioni, fino a quest'estate eh, presidente e eh, sono stata la prima eh, donna eh, presidente del Comitato delle Regioni. Eh, vengo dal eh, governo eh, regionale e locale, sono stata presidente della provincia di Torino, della regione Piemonte e membro del comitato delle regioni dal 98, con un breve intervallo eh, come membro del Parlamento europeo. Sono anche eh, una federalista eh, appassionata e... E, e, di mestiere economista, professore universitario economista. Very good, thank you, Mercedes. Annie is a member of the European Parliament and she's from Greece. Annie. Thank you, Graham. To onomá mu lipon ya na chrisimopiso tin mitriki mu glosa, ke meta tha girisos ta glika. Inan ani podimata, ime di prodos to evropaiku kinovuliu apo tin elada. Μέλος της Επιτροπής Οικονομικών και Νομισματικών Υποθέσεων. Έχω την τιμή και τη χαρά να είμαι η συγγήτρια του Ευρωπαϊκού Κοινοβουλίου για ένα από τα πιο σημαντικά ζητήματα, τις πιο σημαντικές πρωτοβουλίες της τελευταίας νομοθετικής περίοδου, την θέσπιση ενός φόρου χρηματοπιστωτικών συναλλαγών, και όπως είπε και η Mercedes πριν, είμαι και εγώ από την δική μου πλευρά μια παθιασμένη υποστηρίκτρια της ομοσπονδιακής κατεύθυνσης της Ευρώπης.
Committee of the Regions European Parliament. Andreas is from the Euro representing the European Council. He's from Cyprus. Andreas. Ευχαριστώ, επειδή Γιάννη άνοιξε το δρόμο, θα δείτε ότι υπάρχει μια ελληνική πλειοψηφία εδώ. Είμαι, είμαι ο Ανδρέας Μαυρογιάννης, είμαι ο Υφυπουργός Προεδρίας για Ευρωπαϊκά Θέματα της Κύπρου. Ε, ασχολούμαι με την Κυπριακή Προεδρία του Συμβουλίου της Ευρωπαϊκής Ένωσης, ε, κυρίως με θέματα πολιετούς δημοσιονομικού πλαισίου, προϋπολογισμού και διαθεσμικών σχέσεων. Ε, είμαι ευτυχής που είμαι εδώ. Θα είμαι ευτυχέστερο στο τέλο του χρόνου και ακόμη ευτυχέστερο του χρόνου. Και αν μπορώ να έρθω μαζί σα στην Κίνα, θα το κάνω πολύ ευχαρίστω. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Committee of the Regions European Parliament Council. Gregory is representing the European Commission. Gregory. Yes, my name is Gregory Polga. I'm Director General for Communications. And I took up my current job um, just uh, nine months ago. Thank you. Okay, we begin now with a presentation of the latest result or the results from the latest Eurobarometer survey of the state of opinion inside the union. And that will be the thing that we're about that spurs our discussion from now until one o'clock. So this presentation will be given by Mr. De Vogt, who is the global head of TNS Political and Social, which is the organization which carries out the Eurobarometer polling. Mr. De Vogt. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a pleasure for me uh, to, to be able to present and to introduce uh, the results of this uh, very recent uh, Eurobarometer survey that we conducted on behalf of the European Commission. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting study uh, for many reasons. Uh, and I just want to, to, to share with you um, some of the methodological aspects of it, but very quickly, obviously. Um, the, the, the study has been uh, conducted about a month ago, uh, so it's very fresh, um, and uh, you are the first actually to, to be able to see these results. Um, it's a European-wide survey, obviously, representative of the EU population, but it has this particularity to cover 170 regions. That means that we conducted 170 little surveys, if you like, uh, interviewing about 300 people per region to give you the ability to actually look at the results at a very regional level. And that's the beauty of this, uh, this survey. Um, and as you can tell, we interview about 50,000 people in Europe. That's quite massive. Uh, but before, before going into the, the, the results, I, I just want to to explain to you why is it important to actually focus at the regional level. You may be familiar with the Eurobarometer data, and you may be familiar with this first result. And this is a very important question, considering the current context that we are living in. Um, as you can tell from this graph, there is about one quarter of Europeans that feel or judge the situation of their national economy as good, one quarter. 27%. Okay, that means that that could mean that the situation is the same everywhere in Europe, and there is a, a gloomy outlook here at the European level. Well, let's dig a little bit in the data, and let's look at the differences between countries. And I think, I mean, I've been running Eurobarometer surveys for the last 10 years, actually. I've never been confronted with such a big or a diverse uh, diversity in the distribution of the results that we have collected uh, at the country level. 83% uh, of Swedish people feel that their national economy is doing well, whereas 0% of Greeks feel the same. 83 points different between two member states of the European Union. Now, obviously, this kind of contrast with the average that I just shared with you a minute ago. So most probably, the situation is a bit more complicated than the average seemed to indicate. And as we say in French, 
C'est l'arbre qui cache la forêt. This is a tree hiding the forest. But now let's look at the regional level, which I think is quite interesting. Um, these are two important um, uh, graphs, if you like. But because the room is very big, it's difficult for you to, to have a, a clear view. But just focus on the colors. Um, the greener the, the region, the most positive people are about the state of their economy in the region. Okay, the greener, the better. Uh, on, that's the, the left hand side uh, of the screen. And, this again, uh, and once again here, there are big discrepancies at the regional level as well. Not only at the country level, but also at the regional level. Uh, that's not true for all the regions, all the countries. If you look at Spain, for instance, you tend to see kind of a consensus when it comes to judging uh, the state of their regional economy. The same goes for Greece, for Romania, for Bulgaria. But when you look at uh, countries like Belgium, the northern part of Belgium, you may have seen the election uh, recently, the northern part of, of Belgium being more positive about their judgment of their economy compared to the southern part of the country. A look at Italy, northern part of Italy, more positive than the southern part, um, and, and so on and so forth. Now, what is also interesting is to look at, their exp uh, at people's expectations when it comes to the uh, next 12 months. And the question was, how would you see, um, how would you anticipate, let's say, the, the state of the economy in the next 12 months? And the red graph here is actually indicating the level of people saying it will be worse, the situation will worsen in the next 12 months. Um, southern part of Europe not looking too good, as you can tell, but regions where people felt that the situation was quite good are actually starting to say that the situation may worsen in the coming month. As if there were kind of a contamination effect taking place in some parts of Europe. And I think that's something that we should keep in mind. <clears throat> let's turn to quality of life. Here the, the picture is, is, let's say, more homogeneous at the regional level at least. Um, having said that, as you can tell from this picture, the northern part of Europe and the western part of Europe seem to judge their quality of life in a more positive way than their eastern and southern neighbors do. And that's something that we have seen um, also quite recently in other uh, surveys. Now, if I'm turning to quality of life and expectations at regional levels and comparing that with um, the combination of judgment of the state of the economy and expectations for the next few years, you see that there are correlations at regional level sometimes, meaning that the better you feel the quality of life is in your region, the more optimistic you are for uh, the general economic outlook. But there are also some contradictions, also indicating that quality of life is not only explained by economic factors, which is quite interesting, I think. Nevertheless, uh, regions where the economy is challenging or the state of the economy is, is, a, is a real challenge um, feel that in, their, in the majority of cases, the quality of life will uh, be less good than it used to be. Now, you may be familiar with uh, Ronald Zinkelart's theory about post-materialism and, and materialism, and I won't go through this right now. But Basically, we wanted to, to measure what are the top priorities or the top concerns at the regional level that people had or feel uh, was important for them. And let's turn at the results. This is a very homogeneous picture of people saying that the, env the environment is a priority. It's actually the least priority for the people. Uh, there, are, there is only Brittany, I think, and another uh, region in Europe, in, in Sweden, where uh, there is a slightly more people feeling that the environment is a priority. Next priority is actually immigration. I'm insisting, immigration, okay? Especially in uh, southern France, um, in northern Italy, in, uh, in Flanders, uh, also in some parts of, of, of the UK, as you can tell from, uh, from this chart from this map. Crime, 
And there you see some differences between regions uh, appearing sli slightly uh, uh, worrying in some parts of France, in the middle, uh, in the Ile de France, or in the southern part of France, in the Netherlands, some parts of Germany, um, and also some parts of uh, Hungary. Moving to the educational system, next top priority. Uh, a, a real issue apparently in Germany, or in, in all the regions there. Uh, kind of an homogeneous picture that you can tell from this chart. Next top priority, people leaving the country. It seems to be an issue in some parts of Spain, uh, an issue also in France, in, 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 in quite a number of regions there, um, and some parts of, of uh, Eastern Germany, as you can tell, and, and Baltic countries. Next big priority, healthcare system, especially in Eastern Europe, as you can tell from this map. Obviously, no wonder. The second most important priority for Europeans, the economic situation. And this is particularly true in regions in Spain, Greece, uh, Eastern Europe as well, um, Slovenia, and, uh, and other parts of Europe. But as you can tell from this chart, once again, the propagation of the trend uh, when it comes to uh, the economic situation is quite clear. But the top priority for people right now, as we speak, in all the regions, apart from maybe Germany, uh, some, uh, most of the German regions, especially in the southern part of the country, uh, but for the rest, you can tell that unemployment is the top priority for the people at the regional level. And that's true almost everywhere. That's obviously a consequence of the economic crisis. Uh, and this is the, the, the table that summarizes these, um, these uh, maps. 61%, and that's the median I'm, I'm indicating, 61% is the median for unemployment across the 170 regions that we uh, interviewed people in. The next top priority is the economic situation, 32%. So you can tell by yourself the difference between the two. The rest of the priorities are much, much, much less mentioned by people. Okay. Now, um, who is best placed to, to explain what, the, what Europe and what the EU is all about to the people? Well, that's a, a quite an interesting chart, actually. Um, it's actually everyone. Everyone or no one in some parts of Europe, especially in countries where, um, and in regions, sorry, where the economic situation is quite challenging, which is interesting. Um, and, and maybe a question that we should raise afterwards uh, during the debate. But everyone can help um, explaining the EU to people, uh, and, and once you, you'll get the results, uh, the detailed results of this study uh, later today, you'll be able to really identify uh, the top uh, channels to, to, to convey the message to the people. But this is a quite interesting uh, figure, and this also means that there is no such thing as one size fits all approach when it comes to communication, that you have to take this into account. So just to summarize and to finish off, um, I think the, the main message that I would like to convey today is to, first of all, understand that an average can hide major discrepancies and hence the importance to focus at the regional level. Secondly, there is these worrying trends going, uh, taking place in some uh, parts of Europe where the economy was more or less doing okay uh, that seem to indicate that the people tend to be very nervous when it comes to, to the future. The main, just to, to take the, you know, Carville's uh, phrase uh, for Bill Clinton um, campaign back in the 90s, it's not the economy, it's unemployment, stupid, okay? That's the only thing that matters to the people right now. So forget about some more philosophical, you know, um, issues. For the time being, people are very trivial and they want solutions to the unemployment um, issue. But the good news is uh, communication at a very local and, and regional level seems to be vital. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Mr. De Vogt. Now, I'm going to ask the panel to answer briefly uh, one simple question, just to get them started, which is to say, what, if anything, what, if anything, surprises you about this uh, particular, the results of this particular survey? Mercedes. Prima di tutto, sui dati diciamo sulle priorità europee non stupisce che eh, l'occupazione e il lavoro sia al primo punto, eh, stupisce invece un po' l, lo score molto basso dell'ambiente, questo ci dice che eh, nei momenti di crisi l'attenzione alle questioni ambientali cala, mentre noi sappiamo che è sulla green economy che la maggior parte dei posti di lavoro potranno essere creati, quindi eh, mi, mi colpisce questa eh, contraddizione. E la seconda cosa, l'ultima tabella, appare eh, evidente che in una parte eh, dell'Europa, in particolare Regno Unito, e questo non è molto, molto evidente, è molto chiaro perché Francia, dove è più evidente, c'è un forte sistema di poteri locali molto diffuso, molto robusto, c'è fiducia e in altre parti, Austria, parte della Germania, diciamo, tutta l'Europa centrale, fiducia nei rappresentanti eletti regionali e locali, mentre eh, nei paesi più in difficoltà e più periferici la, la sfiducia è generale, tocca tutta la classe dirigente politica perché eh, dalla crisi non riesce, non riesce ad uscire. Eh, è abbastanza curioso che ci sia comunque un certo numero di paesi nei quali per parlare d'Europa si, eh, si ritiene importante parlare con i propri eletti europei e sono però in genere piccoli paesi, questo credo ci debba dire qualcosa sulla difficoltà di rappresentare l'Europa nei grandi paesi. Annie, what surprises you most or doesn't it surprise you at all? Well, I must say that I'm not uh, surprised because as a matter of fact the findings of this uh, survey uh, go very much to the same di direction uh, as uh, a survey conducted by the European Parliament, the Eurobarometer, a couple of weeks ago in the mid of September. So I'm not surprised. I think that the findings uh, confirms that there are some uh, alarming signals and that alarming uh, signals uh, uh, are uh, above all the fact that uh, Europe is divided. There are growing differences and inequalities among and between different member states, but also among the different regions. Uh, this is an alarming signal if we link it with the fact that uh, uh, we are convinced, and I certainly believe that, and I think that more and more we are convinced nowadays, that uh, we need more uh, uh, Europe. We need uh, uh, more Europe not only as an answer to the current crisis, as a way out of the current crisis, but more Europe is the only way that will enable us to create the conditions for uh, a prosperous future for our citizens. Now, in order to be able to put in place the further European integration, the notion uh, of more Europe, we have to be able to uh, overcome, fulfill this gap which is reflected in this survey of growing divisions, of growing pessimism, that means that we, and in, in priority, this responsibility applies to us, uh, uh, European politicians, but also national and local politicians, to restore confidence towards the European citizens that uh, uh, their commitment uh, at the European project, of the, at the project of European integration is really the only way forward. And last point, Graham, I think that another lesson learned from the crisis. For three years, uh, we, have, uh, we have paid too much attention uh, to the lack of confidence from the financial markets. We've done everything, or at least that was our main priority, to restore the market's confidence. We underestimated the growing lack of confidence from the part of European citizens. This is reflected to the findings of this uh, survey. I think that uh, now that it seems 
uh, with a dis ongoing discussion for more European integration, for a better uh, architecture of the economic and monetary union. If we don't manage to fulfill this gap and bring European citizens, their concerns, their priorities, which are expre expressed through these findings, if we do not manage to make this a priority, I think that there are no possibilities to succeed in this path for further integration. Thank you, Annie. When I said to Andreas that I would ask him what surprises him most, he says nothing in this thing surprises me very much at all. Perhaps he has a more mature view now, Andreas. A mature, I think. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I think uh, that uh, overall it, it didn't come as a surprise to me. Of course, uh, to be frank and honest, I wouldn't expect such a degree of uh, gloomy picture, if you like, but overall, uh, if there is one thing that, uh, I mean, goes beyond uh, expectation, is how much, at the end of the day, the economic crisis has contaminated and affected, affected the perception of the people about their quality of life. This is really worrisome, because usually, until now, we were interpreting quality, quality of life not only and explaining it not only through economic indicators, but through social safety nets, through uh, traditional safety nets, family, you know, the society in which you were part of. Uh, now, we have the feeling that there is a fundamental shift, that because of the crisis, uh, you don't have the minimum of elements there in the mix you need in order to talk about quality of life. And, and uh, you mentioned, uh, Mr. DeVort, uh, you mentioned uh, crime, immigration, above all, unemployment. Therefore, uh, restoring trust and confidence now, it becomes extremely difficult. If you don't have the minimum in the mix that defines the quality of life, it means that you don't have uh, confidence and trust, as Mrs. Podimata was saying, and it's more, uh, it's not only communication, it, we have to go beyond, it's about uh, relevance. We cannot have the necessary serenity in order to talk about the European project, about uh, uh, more Europe, and until and unless we answer to the down-to-earth questions that affect people's daily life, such as unemployment is the number one, of course, and prospects in life for the younger generation, which is, I saw it in your review as well. Gregory, uh, how do you, uh, are you surprised by the findings? Um, not particularly. Um, I, I'm a little surprised by the rapidity with which uh, environment has gone down uh, the agenda in, in terms of people cons people's concerns. And this shows how uh, uh, an economic crisis can, um, such as the one we're living through in, in many, many member states, can, can um, uh, uh, change people's minds very quick quickly on subjects that were just yesterday considered as being absolutely uh, primordial. So that, that I was slightly surprised by the speed with which this has gone down the, the, the agenda and um, uh, also by the extent to which it has gone down on the agenda because it's a very homogenous, less than 20% picture across the whole of Europe. Um, another slight surprise is um, the apparent disconnect, uh, but this is only partial, between unemployment and economic recovery. Uh, of course, the main, the, the main lesson of this survey is that the main concerns of, of citizens throughout Europe, or almost throughout Europe, uh, is unemployment. That is their main concern. Um, however, unemployment is the result of an economic crisis. Uh, we have to overcome that crisis, return to growth, uh, in order to solve uh, the problem of unemployment. So they identify the, the deliverable employment as being the most important thing, um, but they seem to underestimate uh, the factors in delivering um, uh, that uh, deliverable. Uh, that is the, the, the economy uh, um, 
as a whole, and uh, the, the elements that underpin uh, a healthy economy, such as the education system, for example. Um, so it, it, it reveals, for me, a rather short-term view, which is understandable in view of the extent of the crisis, um, and a certain disconnect with some of the, some of the um, underlying uh, factors that are the cause of the crisis. Um, I think also uh, this, this means in terms of communicating Europe that we have a real, uh, we, we have, we have a real challenge, but also we have a, a part of the answer to that challenge, and that is that we need to communicate Europe at all levels, um, and in particular at local and regional level. Um, this f first Eurobarometer of this type shows clearly how important it is to communicate uh, it is for, the, for lo local and regional uh, represent elected representatives to communicate Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, you gave the answer yourself. It's a crisis uh, towards uh, politics in general. You will allow me uh, on this very question to, to be a bit uh, iconoclastic and not to really represent either the council or, or my government. Because uh, uh, really I believe that uh, the message from the people for politicians in our part of, the, of Europe is talk less and act more. We don't want you to continue telling us stories. We want you in practice to make the difference for us. So uh, it's a crisis at the national level, it's a crisis at the European level, but uh, this makes Europe appearing also as being far away and far from the preoccupations of the citizens. There is a broken link somewhere, and it's about uh, the political system, both at the national level and the European level, to prove its relevance. When we had more than 20 European councils that all of them solved the economic crisis and every time the next day we start all over again, it means that we are not credible, we are not relevant and we don't want our politicians to come and explain to us why uh, everything is fine and everything uh, should be considered as perfect. Uh, the events are going beyond uh, politicians beyond the political system, politicians are not really in control, so they have to understand that they have to prove their relevance and the relevance of the political systems internally and at the European level also collectively. Just one last uh, little comment. There was this uh, mention of uh, environment. I would defer a little bit. I have the feeling, and this uh, enters into the equation I was uh, describing. You know, people in Europe are not now less environmentally friendly than a bit before. To the contrary, we have managed over the recent years to factor the environmental factor into our lives to certain extent. Now we have the feeling that it's not the top priority to go further whilst we face fundamental questions of survival. But the relevance of the environment shows also in the fact that today, it was mentioned, energy efficiency or things about you know, alternative sources of energy as being part of the answer to the growth and job creation agenda. Therefore, one, uh, one only answer is not enough. We need to find the right mix, and this is what the politi politicians in Europe today uh, do not really succeed. Thank you, Andreas. Mercedes, what do you think about this? Do you think that uh, basically what you see is a rejection of politics, or is it a rejection of the European Union? In this case, uh, for uh, Southern Europe, I think, both, because uh, the crisis uh, uh, for, uh, for people uh, means that uh, local, uh, national uh, politicians uh, are not able to fight against the crisis, uh, but they think also that the European Union is uh, uh, worsening the situation and not improving. So is a, is a general uh, uh, 
conviction that uh, poli politicians at uh, all levels uh, uh, comprising European Union are not able to fight against the crisis. So this, is, I think, is, ve is, very, is very clear. Uh, I, I found uh, interesting the, the fact that uh, for uh, the, the main European population, because uh, the region you saw in green are uh, uh, between the more populated uh, regions in Europe, for this one, uh, local and regional uh, uh, politicians are the, the best place to, to speak about Europe, to explain about, about Europe. So we have to try to recover also in Southern Europe uh, this uh, uh, feeling about uh, local, uh, local elected uh, people. I, It's not simple, it's not simple. Je, je voulais faire une observation euh, sur euh, le fait que ce, pour la première fois, cet eurobaromètre est régionalisé. Et donc, euh, l'effort qu'on que, que devrait faire, c'est de ne pas considérer toujours seulement les États, euh, parce que pour la, dans la plupart de, de ces questions et des, des réponses, on voit des fortes différences euh, régionales aussi. Et, et donc, nous essayons de, euh, de, de faire des raisonnements qui ne soient plus seulement nationaux, mais qui soient euh, européennes et euh, territorialisés euh, si, si possible. Euh, je, euh, deuxième chose, je crois que euh, le fait qu'on on fasse dans une partie importante de l'Europe confiance aux, euh, aux élus locaux pour parler de l'Europe, c'est particulièrement intéressant quand on considère qu'en ce moment, la communication sur l'Europe est pratiquement, dans nos pays, confiée à la communication sur ce qui fait le Conseil euh, européenne, le Conseil de l'Union européenne. La communication, c'est les chefs d'État et de gouvernement décident tout en Europe. Euh, la communication concernant la Commission et le Parlement européen sont presque absentes. Ne parlons pas évidemment de ce que font les collectivités territoriales en Europe. Donc c'est normal que dans beaucoup de pays, on s'attende que ce soit les, les, les niveaux nationaux à, à expliquer, parce qu'on a créé cette euh, concentration communicative. Donc, il faut aussi se, se poser euh, ce type, ce type de, de questions. Mais hum, j'avais soulevé la question de, de, la, de, de la green economy, de, de, du peu d'intérêt à l'égard des politiques d'environnement, parce que, par contre, l'Union européenne, depuis euh, beaucoup de temps en présentant Europe 2020, met l'accent sur le fait que les deux facteurs euh, qui vont créer, qui peuvent créer des emplois et sur lesquels on mise pour créer des emplois en Europe sont les politiques de la green economy et les politiques de, de, la, de la connaissance, l'économie de la connaissance, donc l'agenda digital. Euh, ce qui veut dire quand même que ces messages ne sont pas encore passés euh, au niveau du, du public. Peut-être peut qu'ils sont passés et que les deux choses n'ont pas été mises ensemble dans les questions. Peut-être que si on avait demandé sur quoi il faut euh, euh, miser pour créer des emplois, on aurait eu la réponse euh, juste aussi. Et, et on pense que dans, dans le domaine d'environnement et dans le domaine de, euh, disons de, du digital, on, euh, il y a des possibilités de création d'emplois. Je pense que, euh, comme quelqu'un le disait, ça dépend aussi des questions qu'on pose. Hein. Parfois, les citoyens répondent question par question et ils ne peuvent pas mettre ensemble parce qu'il n'y a pas une question de, euh, transversale. Mais quand même, euh, moi, je m'occupe de, de de questions d'environnement depuis très très longtemps et d'économie de l'environnement, c'est très évident, à chaque crise, euh, l'intérêt pour l'environnement tombe et naturellement euh, augmente celui pour l'emploi et l'économie. C'est aussi, euh, c'est banal, mais c'est évident et là ça confirme, c'est un des peu de cas dans lequel c'est homogène sur toutes les régions d'Europe. Dans la plupart des cas, on voit les différences liées et c'est intéressant, lié d'un côté à, à l'économie, à la situation économique, mais non seulement, parce qu'on voit une perception de bonne qualité de vie, 
aussi dans des régions qui sont en difficulté. Et c'est intéressant de voir les différences. Il y a ceux qui sont en mauvaise situation maintenant, mais qui pensent que ça va s'améliorer. Il y a ceux qui sont en bonne situation, mais qui pensent que ça va s'empirer. Donc, sur tout ça, il faut, il faut raisonner aussi au niveau, de, non seulement de la communication, mais au niveau des, des, des politiques. Ça, c'est un instrument aussi pour réfléchir aux, aux politiques et à la manière d'agir et de, de parler aux citoyens européens. Cela dit, je crois que un peu de, disons, un discours commun, une narration commune sur l'Europe serait utile parce qu'ils euh, reçoivent des messages très, très euh, mélangés, euh, très, très différents et parfois ils, ils sont en difficulté, nos citoyens, à les comprendre. Donc, une narration commune sur l'Europe euh, de toutes les institutions et de, tout, de, 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 de la communication provenant de, de Bruxelles serait probablement utile. Je vais aussi parler en français cette fois-ci. Moi, je, je, je pense, et c'était une suggestion de, de M. De Vort, on voit sur la carte quelque chose d'extrêmement intéressant. On voit l'Allemagne, un pays décentralisé, fédéral, et les gens font confiance au gouvernement national pour expliquer l'Europe, et non pas aux Lindes, non pas aux politiciens locaux, au gouvernement national. Pourquoi Parce que le gouvernement national, il est très présent. Le gouvernement national est un vrai pouvoir en Europe. Il combine l'image avec l'action. Madame Merkel, on peut l'aimer, on ne peut pas l'aimer, mais c'est un acteur central. Alors les gens veulent qu'il y ait, dans toute la mesure du possible, un lien entre l'image, la politique, et l'action. Est-ce que l'image, euh, quel est l'état de l'image euh, de l'Union européenne euh, aujourd'hui euh, ben, Je pense que les chiffres qui ont été cités par le monsieur euh, euh, là-bas sur ma, ma droite euh, indiquent que notre. Euh, que la, si, si, euh, si, la, si on peut trouver une établir une corrélation entre confiance et image, euh, pour autant qu'on puisse euh, établir cette corrélation, euh, l'image des États se dégrade au fur et à mesure que le, la crise empire, mais l'image euh, de l'Union européenne se dégrade plus rapidement. Euh, donc on en est presque euh, maintenant euh, au même niveau des États membres. Euh, donc, c'est euh, l'image du, du système politique euh, dans son ensemble euh, qui s'est dégradée au, pendant ces années de crise. Et je crois que c'est directement attribuable à la crise. Euh, la, la meilleure solution pour améliorer l'image des États membres et, et, et de l'Union européenne, c'est le retour à la prospérité. Ça, c'est clair. Euh, donc, euh, et... Euh, et pour nous qui devons nous occuper de la communication, évidemment, je pense que ce serait beaucoup plus facile, ou ce sera beaucoup plus facile, lorsqu'on aura de nouveau à communiquer sur la prospérité. Un jour, euh, je l'espère, pour le moment, euh, là où on, on doit aussi euh, mettre un peu l'accent en termes de communication, c'est la lumière au bout du tunnel. Parce que beaucoup de mesures qui, qui sont prises ou qui sont en train d'être prises au niveau de l'Union européenne peuvent... Euh, sont, de, sont des solutions au problème. Euh, la, la, ce sont, la, la douleur est, 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 est espérant, la douleur est, est intense, mais espérant qu'elle est, à, elle est, qu elle est à, à, à court terme. Euh, les solutions sont là, mais il n'y a pas de solution capable de produire des effets du jour au lendemain. Donc, euh, pour la communication, c'est un défi. Expliquer que les mesures dures que, qui doivent être prises maintenant conduiront à un retour à, à la prospérité dans dix ans, c'est un défi. Euh, il, faut, il faut que nous exploitions chaque bout qui apparaît, euh, chaque bout de lumière qui apparaît euh, euh, au bout du tunnel. This was also commented before. In the same survey, Um, when the European citizens were asked uh, 
um, their opinion regarding the European institutions and who can defend, who can better defend uh, their interests in Europe. Uh, there was a very significant uh, majority uh, regarding the role of the European Parliament. And why I'm mentioning this? Because I think that this is it to the core of the discussion that we're having, why they recognize the European Parliament. I think that this is because uh, the European Parliament functions in a way that encourages the synthesis and the common European interest in our decision-making process. Uh, within this House, we do not have very powerful countries that can impose decisions to weaker ones. There are no clear majorities in this House, as you know. So in order to be able to make a decision, we have and we have learned to seek convergences. So this is recognized, I believe, outside the European Union, from the European citizens, I mean. And this is important because this uh, um, confirms, in my view, the power uh, of democracy. Mr. Blumelhuber. So thank you. Before I answer your question, I would like to give a comment on your remarks. Crises come and go, but strong brands can live forever. So there are different kinds of brands. Of course, there are some brands that are open to change, and any brand is open to change based on some experiences of the consumers. But on the other hand side, brands also can be something very, very stable. And if you do communication, and if you are responsible for the brand, then I think we have to work on both sides, on the explicit brand, so that's open to change, and also on the very implicit part of the brand image, and this is something very, very stable. So and now I'd like to answer uh, your question. I would like to give you three answers, and every answer has three ideas, so it's a matrix of three multiplied three ideas. So what is a brand? So to start very, very briefly, and there are different ideas of how we could perceive what brands are, I cherry-picked three of those ideas. First of all, I think that brands are always a compensation for something. We live in a world that's difficult. That's what we discussed now. And there are two European superstars who give us an idea about the world we live in. Uh, a Polish sociologist, or I think the biggest sociologist of our time, Sigmund Baumann, and a French philosopher, Shirley Povetsky, and they label our times the liquid or the hypermodernity. So we live in times that change. And we live in times that change faster and faster and faster. And the times change faster as we, or you the politicians, could react on. And that's very difficult for everyone, and that's also very difficult for every citizen. And so living in a world that's faster and faster and faster, that needs for every single person kind of a compensation. And what is the compensation to something that is changing? This, of course, is something that is stable. And the most stable idea in our life is what some people call love. So, what we need in a fast-changing world, we need more love. And so at the end, what brands deliver is kind of a, a love story. And what is love? There is an Austrian book, it's I think the most important book of the Sado Maso literature. It's called Venus in Fur. And based on this book, some people define how long love lasts, and the answer is very disappointing because they say love only lasts one evidence, so one moment. Love is like a porn, so it's based on single moments. But every single moment a person has with a brand could be used to create something like love. So this means if I had to communicate Europe, the main question would be, what are the moments we have with the citizens, and what could we do in all those moments to create this image, to create such kind of love idea? And I come back to some of those ideas. The second idea, what a brand is, is, and this is, I think, very close to what most communication people do, a brand is like a frame. It's like a background. And I just want to show two pictures uh, 
Daniel Kahneman has shown in 2002 when he received his Nobel Prize for Economics. He sh showed us two products or two gray squares, and this could be two politicians, this could be two countries, two regions, whatever. And of course now you, the communication people, you have now to sell this gray square. And then you say, oh, it's so difficult to sell a gray square. So we have to pimp it up. So pimp up Europe, pimp up a politician, pimp up the gray square, so you make it a little bit more beautiful. But then comes the, your boss, so the I department or whatever, and says, no, we cannot pimp up what we have. We have to sell what's there. So we sell gray squares. And so when we sell gray squares, we need now you, the great communication people. And what we do is now, we frame the square. So we put a different background behind it, so or frame around. And we frame a gray square, and this means that the perception now of the inner square is different. So we didn't change anything objectively on the inner square, but the perception of the inner gray square changed. And so the way how we communicate Europe changes, of course, the way how Europe is perceived. So, and some people overdo it a little bit. What they create is what I would call a donut brand. Yeah? So a donut brand is something very fat, a donut. You should not eat it. And you have all the fats and the sugar and everything, but there is a hole in the middle. Yeah? And lots of brands are exactly managed this way. So we put some sugar on it, some fat thing around it, but there is no core of it. So we should also manage the core. Yeah? It's not the blackberry on the top of the cake, it's what's inside the cake we have to deal with. And the third idea I want to give you what a brand could be is a brand is a platform where people meet. So a brand is not managed by politicians. A brand is not managed by brand managers. A brand is managed by how people behave. So in the end, in the case of Europe, the brand Europe is managed in the way how Europeans behave and how Europeans sell the idea of Europe to their friends. That's the idea, that's three ideas of branding and now I come to three ideas of Europe. So what is Europe? Is Europe the anti-US? Is it a continent? Is it kind of a Disneyland for some kind of people? Or Oh, sorry. Or could we see Europe also as a brand, as kind of a compensation, as kind of an idea, as kind of a platform? And I'd like to give you a few ideas what it could mean that Europe is a compensation, an idea, and a platform. There was another study done in 2007 based on the data from the Eurobarometer from Jimenez and some others. And they tried to identify which kinds of identification do people, so do European citizens have with their nation states, with the region, and with Europe. And they found out that there were two kinds of identification or identity. There is a cultural one, so this means that people identify with the culture, with the language, with symbols, with all the nice ideas, so that's more a brand from the heart. And then there is a more instrumental thinking, a more instrumental uh, identity, where people argue in their self-interest. What does this brand give me, and what do I have to give in return? And what they found out based on this study is that Europe is this instrumental identity, and the nation or the region is more the hard thing. So this means one identity, yeah, yeah, I have seven minutes, that's what I've learned now. So that um, the one identity could now be the compensation for the other. So that perhaps Europe has a big advantage and that's its size, and perhaps not so much the culture in the minds of the people. And that the region have the big advantage of being close to the citizens and so to have more of this love affair. I come back to this in a second. 
Another idea could be that Europe is an idea. An idea means a story. So Europe or any brand needs a story, and it should be a positive story. And if I ask my students what positive story does Europe tell us, and they say, we don't know. There is no positive story we all share. But we all know lots of negative stories. And this is the power of attribution. Because what happens very often, the nice experiences we have are attributed perhaps to a region or a city, but the bad experiences we have, they're very often attributed to Europe. I'll make you an example. I arrived on the airport uh, on Sunday, and we all, everyone who lives in Brussels know about this very stupid taxi system at this airport in Serventum. So you arrive on a Sunday evening, you queue up for one hour to get a taxi. Then you're in the taxi and then you complain a little bit, I had to wait for one hour. And then a taxi driver really said, oh, that's because of your bub. So, so the bad thing, so I'm not German, I'm Bavarian. Yeah? Everything that's good in Bavaria is made in Bavaria. Everything that works bad in Bavaria is done in Brussels. Yeah? So negative things are attributed normally or very often in the minds of people to Europe and the good things to some regions. And I think this could and should perhaps change. And Europe could also serve as a platform, a platform where people share those good stories. And the good stories people share could be more than the UEFA Champions League and the Eurovision Song Contest. Yeah? This is what people now share. This is the actualities everyone shares, but perhaps you could manage a few more of those ideas. And now, the next, the last four minutes I have, I would like to give you three suggestions. In this cherry picking, I just picked up three ideas how the brand Europe could be communicated. And the first idea I want to share with you is do not expect too much. It's difficult to brand Europe. Europe does not have a European dream people rely on. Mark Leonard once said, Europe's weapon is the law. It's the regulations everyone complains about. And the size, of course, is an advantage. Why not sell the size of Europe? Why not make the regulation more sexy? And you're the experts how to do it. Uh, and on the other hand side, we have the regions. And of course, the regions, they have the possibility to brand itself based on this positive side, based on those experiences. It's about experiences, or in other words, Brands have a face. Strong brands have a face. Yeah? Uncle Ben's has a face. Uh, Facebook is about face. And uh, Lacoste has the crocodile, so there's a face everywhere. And this also means brands have faces. And I come back to my idea in the beginning. The most important face of Europe, that's the people of Europe. And how can we manage that the people, the citizens, sell their idea and their brand? And what could we give them? How could we make them ready to fulfill the promise of Europe? And the question could be, what is the promise of Europe? And it's very difficult to answer it. I just want to give you one answer. Nicolas Nicopanti once said, Europe is only strong in design. So how do we fulfill the promise of good design and good high arts in Europe. This is what all my friends who do not come from Europe suggest as being totally Europe. Art house, cinema, museums, opera houses, and good design. So that's Europe for them. And then you ask my students, and then it says, how can this Europe have such a boring and ugly website? Yeah. It starts with these small ideas. Yeah, we want to have these big ideas, these promises fulfilled. And now comes my last idea, two minutes. A strong brand, Europe, and a strong regional brands could be built. I'm very sure about this. But this comes with a price tag. And the price tag is Germany, Belgium, Bulgaria, and even France. What does it mean? There is a very nice book published a few weeks ago by an Austrian guy who lives in Germany, Michael Ziegelwagner, Kaffee Anschluss. That's the title of the book. 
and it's his first book. And in the first chapter, in the first sentence, he asks, Wer braucht Deutschland? Who needs Germany? And the second sentence is the answer. And the answer is nobody. Nobody needs Germany. Why should I need Germany as a German? I have Bavaria for this local cultural identity and perhaps for the big things that go on, yeah, where size matters, there is a, a Europe. And as a management professor, I could come back to the good old Michael Porter and everyone knows his famous saying, there's a stuck in the middle. And perhaps the nation state is a little bit stuck in the middle. So my last suggestion for you is, and I know it's a little bit long term, but you can work on it, get rid of the nation state. <laughs> Thank you very much.